Thank you everyone for joining today's session. Uh, so today we'll be dealing with palliative care emergencies. There are so many situations which comes under emergencies, but today we'll be touching upon the most important ones. Uh, and today we have Dr. Vinita as our faculty. She has completed her training in palliative medicine. She has done both the certificate course as well as uh, MSc in palliative medicine from Cardiff University. She was working in a corporate hospital in Kerala for some years and uh, as a part of the oncology team, uh, integrating palliative care into oncology practice. And currently she's in the department of uh, community medicine in Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi, which is again in Kerala. Thank you, Dr. Vinita, for agreeing for another session with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Devi. And uh, thank you, Pali, for the invitation. So um, uh, the topic for today is uh, emergency in palliative care. And uh, let me just first share my slides. Is this visible? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'll just put it on slide for now. Is it moving? Is the slide moving? Uh, now it is Zoom. Uh, no, it's slide is not open. We can see. Be specialized. Those of you who are already specialized and. Uh, yeah. Um. It's a bit of unlearning of what we have been doing. It's a little bit of uh, not being so aggressive, I must say. Uh, it is um, taking things in a different way where you are focusing more on quality of life. So why are we having a sessions on emergencies in palliative care? I would like uh, all of you to be interactive in this session because we are going to learn from each other rather than you know, me giving a lecture here. So I would really appreciate it if all of you could share in your points. So why do we need to study on uh, you know, emergencies in palliative care? Yes, you can use the chat box. If you feel shy to speak, you can always use the chat box. What do you think are the emergencies in palliative care that you could come across in your patients? You can message in the sh a chat box. To decide about the invasiveness of surgery is what Drea would like to say. Cord compression, Dr. Ashwin says. Yeah. Ah, uh, Dr. Ashwin also says about SVCO, superior vena cable obstruction. And Dr. Danwati says uh, breakthrough pain. Dr. Mohammed says malignancy itself can present. Dr. Pratiksha says acute breathlessness. Dr. Haripriya also, we have an entire long list coming up. That's wonderful. Yes, breathlessness, bleeding. And Dr. Vandana says uh, we tend to be aggressive, which may not be required in emergency. Okay. And yes, things like fracture, respiratory failure, obstructions, deep vein thrombosis, bubble obstructions, and all of you are absolutely right. When it comes to palliative care, we are dealing with normal patients who are going through um, a chronic phase of their uh, illness, which has no cure. They have to live with it. And they are just going to have... Um, any other medical situation, like just any other person. So we have to manage uh, the medical event that has occurred sometimes with complete emergency. And that's exactly what all of you have listed here. And what we need to understand is 
which all do we have to manage with an emergency and how much of emergency do we have to um, go about it with okay so emergency as you know it is an acute injury or illness that poses an immediate risk to a person's life or long-term health and yes, you all agreed there can be emergencies in palliative care. And I would like to bring your attention to this diagram over here, this diagram over here. As you can see, as you can see, right from the time of diagnosis, let me tell you, right from the time of diagnosis, palliative care starts along with curative treatment. Okay, maybe the share of palliative care is less, and it's mostly curative treatment. But during the course of disease, when the active uh, treatment is being given, there might be a time when it comes, the disease itself comes to an incurable state. And that is when palliative care seeps in even more. And the focus is more on uh, symptom management and assuring quality of life of that patient until the time of death. And as you can see how the transition of palliative care goes on until that pink block over there that you see is EOLC, end of life care. And then death happens. And what happens after death? Palliative care does not stop even then. It continues as bereavement care for the family. Right. So what I would like to tell you here is that in case of emergencies in palliative care, we might have to be all on and we have to be all aggressive during the curative phase. Yes, palliative care might also require uh, transferring the patient to the ICU if that is going to make a change and benefit to the patient. And then more towards end of life care, as the patient moves more towards end of life care, it's going to be managing the patient um, purely for his symptom. And we do have an entire list of uh, emergencies in palliative care, but today we are going to be concentrating more on spinal cord compression, superior vena cable obstruction, and terminal hemorrhage. So many of you had uh, given an entire list. And uh, yes, acute pain, spinal cord compression, superior vena cable obstruction, hypercalcemia, delirium, end of life symptoms, hemorrhage, sepsis and neutropenic patient, and seizures, and many more. This so, uh, it's a big list of emergencies that we do have to manage in our patients in palliative care. So what, what are the important questions that you need to ask your patients? What is it that is the deciding factor that helps you understand what to do next? So ask yourself, is the problem of the patient reversible? My intervention with the aggressive treatment for this patient, is it going to reverse the situation? Your patient with carcinoma of the ovary, with lung metastasis, if the patient is given a prognosis of just another three weeks and he comes to you, she, uh, he, uh, she is brought to you uh, with severe breathlessness, terminal breathlessness, are you justified in transferring that patient to the ICU? And whatever intervention that you do there, is it actually going to reverse the problem? How is it going to improve and maintain the patient's quality of life? Okay, maybe if you do a bit of thoracosynthesis over there, just to relieve the pressure and make the patient a little comfortable, but is the pain that uh, you are going to uh, give the patient with your procedure, is it going to make the patient comfortable? Or is, it, is there anything else that you can do to make the patient much um, comfortable in terms of symptom management? 
what is the disease status and what is its prognosis. So we know it's an advanced case of uh, ovarian cancer, stage four, and the prognosis that has been told to you by the oncologist is just another three weeks. And the patients and the family's wishes, the most often, most often what happens is that the family is outside the room and the medical team uh, is discussing with the family members about what to do next. And the patient doesn't get to know any of these, isn't it? So what was the wish of the patient? Did she actually want to get that needle into her chest wall? What was the wish of the family? Is it just because as a doctor, you told that this has to be done? And the family just thought that, okay, it looks like there is no other option, so we just have to do it. And if you do not do it, my wife or my mother who is in there is going to suffer. Whether the treatment outweighs the distress that is caused by the symptoms. So whatever breathlessness that is being caused, is it going to worsen? What if your procedure is going to cause a pneumothorax? And is that going to be even worse than the breathlessness that the patient is having? So these are like a million dollar questions that you have to ask yourself before you go really aggressive on your patient during an emergency. So let's go through a few scenarios and get into you know, our topics for today. Raj, a 63-year-old gentleman who has been on androgen blocking for carcinoma prostate, he has come to you today with complaints of severe back pain with a pain score of 9 on 10. And he's also saying that there is numbness over his lower limbs. What is your action plan? Yes. So what do you think it is? You can use the chat box. Yes, Dr. Amrita was asking about a non-medical emergency from the patient's perspective. That's a very interesting area. Amrita, I would like to get back to that topic right after this session. I, would, uh, I really have something to share on it as well. Yeah? So please do remind me just in case I forget. Yes, um, Dr. Revati was saying about medication for pain. Okay, uh, yes. Secondaries in the spine, Dr. Vandana says. Yes, Rajas having, could be having secondaries in the spine. Yes, Dr. Girija says, let's get a CT scan done and find out what exactly is happening. Yes, and radiation therapy could be the answer to it. Dr. Girija adds on. Yes. So why do you think he is having pain and then numbness down his legs? Yes. What are we looking at here? What kind of emergency are we looking at here? Yes, Hari Priya says it's a, Dr. Hari Priya says it's metastasis of the spine and cord compression. Dr. Shun Myon says it's cord compression. Dr. Rishikesh, Dr. Kanmani, everybody agrees to it. And yes, we are looking at spinal cord compression, right? So what is so important about the spinal cord compression? Um, say we say that, you know, uh, okay, uh, doctor was saying earlier that we had to take a CT of the spine. So, okay, so we refer the patient to the CT center. You're, you are working in a rural area and then you're sending the patient to a nearby diagnostic center and they have given you a date and they have given the patient a date after like four days. So what do you do? Can we wait for four days? What happens in second, uh, spinal cord compression? Why is the time factor important? Any thoughts on that? Yes, Dr. Jaya says it could lead to paraplegia. Yes, right now he's come with paraparesis and it could lead to paraplegia. Yes, Dr. Kanmani says the same. And Dr. Ashwin also says about starting steroids. Yes, definitely. So get the MRI done is also what he says. Yeah, so... Spinal cord compression can lead to paraplegia. 
And once the paraplegia is set in completely, it will be very difficult to reverse the situation. So that is a diagrammatic representation showing where the injury is caused and what it could lead to. It's self-explanatory, right? And spinal cord compression is seen in 5% of cancer patients. 10% of patients with vertebral metastasis develop spinal cord compression. And what, have, what you see usually is, uh, it's, it's, it's a very subtle sign that is seen in the early stages. So by the time actually your patient comes to you, it's probably too late. So when your patient with um, carcinoma, for example, comes to you with a low back pain and tells you, you know what, doctor, I've been just traveling too much. I come from a faraway place. I come here all the way to take my chemotherapy. And these days with the travel, my back is aching so badly. Please help me out here. So always, always keep in mind the illness could be presenting right now to you as a metastasis and probably for all you know, that is the cause for the backache and you have to check out for the impending cord compression in this case, right? And uh, spinal cord compression is most common in multiple myeloma, breast cancers, bronchi uh, carcinoma of the lung, prostate, bladder, kidney. And most of the time, it is most commonly seen in the thoracic segment. Mechanism of spinal cord compression, there is an erosion. It could present as an erosion of the vertebral body metastasis into the um, epidural space, which is most common. There could also be a vertebral collapse or it could be just a spread of the tumor through the inter uh, intervertebral foramen or it could be just an interruption of the vascular supply. And what are the symptoms that the patient could present with? Backache. The patient tells you very typically that it increases on standing. It's better when I lie down. Also, he tells you about root pains, which is increased on strain. And also, he could present with stiffness or weakness and also alter sensations in the feet, which is, it starts with the feet. They keep telling, um, they probably come to you telling about some numbness, which is found in the feet. And it's rather, it's all, uh, most of the time it's seen ascending upwards. And by the time actually the patient presents with a bladder symptom, bladder bubble symptom, it might be a late sign. So if your lesion, uh, if the lesion of your patient is above L1, below L1, just with clinical history and clinical examination, we will be able to understand where is the lesion. So if your patient is presenting to you with spastic paresis or increased reflexes on examination, and you find that the plantars are also upgoing, and you check for the sensory level and you see impairment and um, the patient is also having a local and a radicular back pain. Now with this, it's almost towards a lesion which is above L1. And if the lesion is below L1, there's mostly a presentation of flaccid paralysis. The reflexes are absent. The plantars are downgoing. And you might see dermatomal sensory changes and also sometimes the bladder and the bowel is affected. Yes, so like I told you, clinical examination is very important. It helps you to localize the lesion. And again, investigations are going to just confirm your clinical examination findings. So what is the investigation of choice? The MRI, right? So much of, um, uh, many of the times, uh, MRI may be difficult to access at the point uh, that you are working at. So just in case MRI is not easily accessible, your next choice is definitely X-ray. 
But mind you that more than 50% of bone destruction is required for the uh, changes to be evident on an X-ray. So how do you manage it? Yes. So now that we have seen the clinical features, now that you see uh, these are the clinical features, how do you manage this patient? Yes, can you use the chat box? Yes, Dr. Danwanti says steroids. Definitely, steroids. What else? Would you like to mention a dose that would be uh, best for this patient as well? What else would you give to the patient who has come to you with spinal cord compression? Steroids? Yes, Dr. Danwanti said steroids. Other than that? The rest of you, medications for neuropathic pain, says Dr. Kanmani. Uh, Dr. Vandana says methylprednisolone. Yes, Dr. Ashwin says 8 to 16 milligrams twice daily of corticosteroids. Yeah. Any more? Can we do vertebroplasty? Yes, it depends how... Uh, how close... Uh, it depends... Uh, remember the graph that I was talking about whether it is tolerable for the patient at that point of time, what is the prognosis uh, of the patient, what is the disease status of the patient, is there any options other available which will maintain the quality of life of that patient. So these are the different factors which will tell you uh, whether you have to refer your patient for vertebroplasty or else are you going to manage your patient conservative. Yes. And uh, Dr. Ashwin was also talking about dexamethasone. Dr. Shunyama says about dexamethasone, radiotherapy, and surgery. And again, Dr. Girija was talking about methylprednisolone and radiation therapy. Yes, thank you for your responses. And we go further. So, like one of you was saying, you know, time is the essence. Yes. So urgent intervention within 24 hours. Urgent intervention, urgent intervention within 24 hours is mandatory. Corticosteroids, preferably dexamethasone is used. 16 milligrams is what I have written here, but most of the times in practice, I have even given to 40 milligram, 40 milligram IV single dose before evening time is given for four days and check for a response. So we usually prefer for a single dose because it has a prolonged action. And also we prefer to give it any time from the morning till early evening because giving it a night dose can interfere with the patient's sleep. Radiotherapy or surgery. So now how do we decide? Do we have to advise this patient for radiotherapy or do we have to advise this patient for surgery? Any thoughts on that? Who do we uh, advise surgery? Who do we advise radiotherapy? Yes? Surgery, radiotherapy, the option, any particular features, radiosensitive disease, Dr. Ashwin says probably that would be a situation where we call for a RT. Dr. Ashwin also says lymphoma. Yes, uh, lymphoma tumors, they just melt with radiotherapy. Yes. Multiple level, Dr. Jaya says multiple level um, uh, uh, compressions are usually treated with radiotherapy. Thank you for that point. Yes? Do we have any more coming in? Yeah. So we are going to go, uh, our next slide will cover the uh, deciding factors. And of course, adjuvant chemotherapy also might be required. Uh, say it is in situations especially like lymphoma. And interdisciplinary approach is a must 
because this is not just about the palliative physician there. This is also about the oncology team. This is also about the physical medic uh, medicine and rehabilitation team because all this should go side by side. It is only then we can um, manage the situation at its best. So indications for surgery is sometimes, you know what, there I have seen myself of how some people present uh, the primary presentation of the disease. The disease per se, that is cancer, is uh, a spinal cord compression. They come with a history of, you know, paraparesis. And on investigation, it was found that the patient had CA with bone metastasis. So what if you do not have a tissue diagnosis? The surgery might be one indication where you go in, uh, I mean, tissue diagnosis is one indication where you go in for a surgery. And again, if the patient is not able to take radiotherapy or the patient is on radiotherapy and has to read it recently and there is a further deterioration on that. And again, uh, bone destruction with spinal stability. So if it is a single bone vertebral lesion, yes, and also for spinal stability, instability, its uh, surgery is indicated. And for a cervical cord lesions, definitely, definitely surgery is the indication. And all those patients who came to your OPD walking will be that 70% of those patients who came to your OPD walking will be able to go out walking as well. They might have presented to you with a paresis. They might be able to go out walking. Only 30 patients, 30% uh, of those patients who came wa walking to your OPD will be able to walk out. But only 5% of those patients who came with complete paraplegia will be able to walk out after treatment. So you can see the decline in the response to the treatment as the clinical uh, deterioration is happening because of the spinal cord compression. And it carries a poor prognosis. Now coming to the long-term management, the mobility and protection of the spinal cord, again, skin care and bowel interventions have also to be looked into. The patient is kept immobilized in bed and uh, it is very necessary to advise skin care and uh, probably the patient is on Foley's catheter and um, the patient is not able to defecate and maybe suppositories have to be given or enema has to be given uh, for him to attain a bowel movement. So uh, also rehabilitation, isometric exercises all should be uh, made to do uh, passively by um, the physiotherapist and later he teaches it to the family where the family can continue it on their own. Psychosocial support is extremely important because this individual that we are talking about is not just the patient, but is probably the head of the family or the woman of the house. So having a complete loss of role over a day and being there on that bed not being able to involve himself or herself into her family's activities, into his family's activities, and not be able to make any more decisions or bring in money for the house, it's terrible. So a lot of psychosocial support is also required for not just the patient, but also the family. Yes, so now we move on with the rest of the case presentations, I mean, the scenarios. Tage, who is a 47-year-old gentleman, he has completed his six-cycle chemotherapy, okay, uh, for carcinoma lung, carcinoma lung. And this was about two months back, and he has come for review to you. And what he tells you is that, I must say that I have been feeling as if my breath is stuck at my throat. Is it because I have put on weight that I'm feeling all puffed up? So what are we looking at? He had a carcinoma of lung for which he was treated. Until two months back, 
and he's feeling as if he has bloated up and he's feeling breathless. Yes, Dr. Danwanti was saying could be a medicinal compression. Yes, Dr. Samiran also agrees to it. It could be SVCO. Yes, we have Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Kanmani, everybody supporting that. Yes, we could be looking at SVCO. So what do we do here? How are we going to help this guy? How are we going to manage? Yes. Okay, Dr. Jaya says radiation. Okay. Dr. Girja says steroids. Yes. Yes, again, Dr. Girja also agrees to radiation. Dr. Ashwin says, but it could depend on the diagnosis. And Dr. Samiran says steroids and radiation. So let's see more on this. So superior vena cable obstruction, it was caused by a tumor in the media center and preventing the venous drainage from the head, arms, upper trunk. And it is commonly caused by example of few cancer, cancers that is the bronchus, cancer of the bronchus, which is most, most common. And then also you do see it in lymphomas. Cancer of the breast, esophagus, colon, testis, benign causes. Now these are the rare causes, but most often you see it in carcinoma of the bronchus. And of course, lymphomas as well. And uh, any other situation? Any other situation? Okay, we've been talking about obstructive masses sitting right there on the superior vena cava and obstructing it. Anything else that you can think of, which is causing a superior vena cava obstruction? Oh, Dr. Ashman was also talking about stenting. Yes, thanks. So what else could be causing the superior vena cava obstruction if not for that mass over there? Mediastinal goiter, yes, again, it is a mass. Yes, anything else that you can think of? Yes, it could be a tumor thrombus. Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Um, Arevati says it could be a thymoma. Uh, Dr. Rishiki says it could be a renal cell carcinoma. It could be, again, a tumor thrombus. Yes, Dr. Haripriya also uh, says it could be. Well, you know, for uh, uh, patients with cancer, most often you would have seen, they have very difficult venous access and uh, they are advised uh, peripherally inserted central catheters, thick lines. So one of the problems also about thick lines is that it could lead to thrombus formation, especially because cancer is a hypercoagulase, right? So that itself can also cause obstructive features, right? So mechanism of SVCO, it can be an extrinsic pressure, it could be a direct invasion of the tumor, or it can be a inter intraluminal thrombosis, which is seen in central veins. Usually it takes over weeks or months uh, to, uh, it may take weeks to present as, but sometimes what happens is that when it is too long standing, collaterals develop around it and you might uh, not pick it up. So what happens is that Suddenly, in SVCO, an emergency what uh, that you see is laryngeal edema, right? So that is one of the emergencies, a very tricky emergencies that you see. The patient just comes to you totally out of breath. So the symptoms, it is dyspnea because of the tracheal edema. Headache is more on stooping forward because of the cerebral edema. There is visual changes. There is dizziness, syncope. Swelling of the face, neck, and arms. And how do you diagnose? If you do not have a CT uh, facility in your um, hospital or clinic, um, you can always do an X-ray. So X-ray will help to at least identify that there is a mask sitting over there. CT ch chest uh, would be most preferable. And venography can be done if you are planning to insert a stem. 
So what do you do? Like most of you said, yes, dexamethasone is right there in that list. And radiotherapy also, like you all said, it is there. Stent, yes, that is also there in that list. What more? So this patient has to get admitted. This is a emergency. So what you do for a patient who comes to you with severe breathlessness, you make the patient sit up right, isn't it? And also, um, breathlessness leads to anxiety. Anxiety further worsens the breathlessness, which further worsens the anxiety. So what you have to do is cut the cycle. To cut the cycle, you need to maintain the patient um, in calmness. So for that purpose, you can give a short-acting benzodiazepine. So generally what I use is lorazepam. I, can, I usually give a tablet of um, uh, one milligram, or you can even use uh, a two milligram if it's very severe. So one milligram is usually what I give, and I give it sublingual, a tablet that you can give sublingual, also helps during this time. Dexamethasone, 16 milligram to about 24 milligrams, uh, uh, practically, sometimes, you know, we could alter the dose. Uh, so, but in general, 16 milligrams is an average dose that has to go in to bring about the action. So sometimes, you know, it, dif it differs from institution to institution. So sometimes it's 24 milligrams, sometimes it's 28 milligrams. I've seen more than that. So it really, um, there is no hard and fast rule there, but at least 16 milligram is what has to go in there to bring about the desired effect. Now, again, diuretics is also important. Prusamide, 40 milligram IV, subcutaneous. Again, oxygen trial. Uh, oxygen trial to treat the breathlessness. Okay. And uh, why do we say oxygen trial? Because again, oxygen, we need to see if the patient is actually getting symptomatically better with oxygen because we are not treating the uh, pulse oximeter, we are treating the individual. So always look if the patient is getting uh, symptomatically better with the oxygen, uh, else we give bolus of oxygen when required. And also opioids help, opioids like morphine, they help to, uh, they help to bring down the breathlessness. Um, basically, it helps to bring down the sensitivity uh, towards carbon dioxide and acts on the respiratory cycle. And this helps to, and this is how opioids can help in breathless patients. And again, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, all to bring down the size of the tumor and stents. Stents also can be uh, advised. Now, um, stents are expensive. So you need to select your patients. You need to think of the prognosis. You need to think of the cost. And um, accordingly, you need to make the decision. And dexamethasone, uh, how does it help? It helps to decrease the peritumoral edema, which is around the mass. It is not going to shrink the mass. It is only the peritumoral edema, which is around the tumor mass, that helps to bring down. And also, it helps to bring down the edema in case of laryngeal edema. Yes. So next, we are going to talk about hemorrhage. So what are the causes for hemorrhage in palliative patients? Yes, your thoughts. Please use the chat box. Hemorrhage is definitely an emergency that you see in palliative care. But how, I mean, what are the different reasons? Tumor can bleed. Yes, Dr. Girita says that tumor can bleed. Dr. Mohammed says that it could be a fungating tumor which is bleeding. Yes, Dr. Jaya says hemoptysis. Dr. Vandana says bleeding through the tumor. Yes. So maybe you have this you know, cervical uh, lymph node mass, which is sitting there and it is uh, ulcerated, it's fungating, and it is so deep, it invades through the carotid. There is a carotid blowout. 
and it gives rise to torrential bleed. Right? Sometimes it's not so torrential. It's something that you can manage. There might be large fungating woods which are bleeding. Yes, doctor, like Dr. Kanmani was saying, thrombocytopenia can also cause further bleeding in such patients. It can be because of various reasons. Maybe this patient is on chemotherapy and the patient has gone into uh, sepsis, neutropenic sepsis, where you know the platelet counts go down. And this itself could have led to bleeding in such patients. What else? DIC. Yes, DIC. Also, the D-dimer levels have gone up so much high that itself can cause bleeding. Dr. Mohammed says RT-related. Yes, sometimes that itself can cause. It can cause like, um, you know, a post-RT telangiectasia, which is seen. Uh, that itself can present with bleeding PR. Uh, which is seen uh, after RT in some patients over a period of, of, after a long time. Yes. Any other causes? Carotid artery erosion due to head and neck cancer. Yes, Dr. Hari Priya was just mentioning about that. And your patients are also on different kind of analgesic. So most of them are probably gastric friendly, but there are some which is not that gastric friendly like the NSAs, that itself can cause, isn't it? So in the event of a severe hemorrhage, the risk for bleed uh, or the risk of a bleed is significant. So what is needed is a discussion with the patient and family is very important. So in the need to make an informed decision of what could be done, because every time the patient is not in front of you, the patient is going to go home. They need to know what to do at an event like this. What should the family do for the patient at an event like this? Most of the time, they are going to be in shock. They do not know what to do. So it may not be appropriate for patients at the end of life to be transferred to another site for interventions that may not be of significant survival benefit or which do not add quality of life. So this further helps us understand that we need to know what to do at the bedside so that, you know, we can control the symptom at the same time, you know, the patient is able to keep the communication going with the family in case of terminal bleeding. Till the time of death, at least, you know, what we can do to maintain that quality of life, to keep the communication going. So hemorrhages may be, like you all said, it could be because of the malignancy per se. It could be because of steroids. It could be because of NSAIDs. It could be because of some clotting impairments like thrombocytopenia, uh, hepatic insufficiency, or anticoagulants. Your patients who are on warfarin. Okay, now if uh, they are uh, to maintain a therapeutic dose of warfarin, most often the INR is kept at two to three range. So what happens if the patient, you know, is just taking warfarin and, you know, does not look at his INR and it shoots up all the way to five, the patient probably presents to you with hematuria. So these are all different factors where your patient could come to you with him, right? So the general risk factors, we have talked about it already, thrombocytopenia, large head and neck tumors, and then large centrally located uh, lung cancers, refractory, acute and chronic leukemia, if the tumor, uh, the, if the malignancy itself, uh, say like in hematological malignancies, where, uh, you know, it can cause bleeding like leukemia, then myelodysplasia, and again, metastatic liver diseases, where uh, the entire clotting factors are impaired, the prothrombin time, everything is deranged. That itself are uh, general risk factors. Now there are more uh, specific risk factors uh, for carotid artery rupture. Uh, you can see this in the uh, algorithm given here. This is going to help you identify which patient is at risk, right? So uh, a patient who is uh, having a surgery, a radical neck dissection, 
who's having a radiotherapy, post, uh, uh, poor post-operative healing, visible arterial pulsations that are seen uh, probably on the ulcer bed, and uh, pharyngocutaneous fistulas, fungating tumors, or maybe the patient has some other morbidities like diabetes over 50 years or uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, loss of body weight. He is immunodeficient or is malnourished. Okay, so these are your risk factors. So, what do you do? As you can see here, you refer them to the MDT, okay, the multidisciplinary team. So, this can comprise of an oncologist, surgeon, okay, it's also comprises of the nursing team, the pharmacist, maybe it's a terminal event, you might have, need the chaplain also involved over here. And there has to be a, um, a space for advanced planning. What should be done in case the patient is showing, uh, you know, his last signs? So factors to consider patient prognosis, patient performance status, and perceived quality of life and preferences at this hour when the decisions are being made. And accordingly, you discuss with the patient and the family. So level of discussion depends on how likely the MDT feels that terminal hemorrhage may occur. And it's also the patient and family's knowledge and acceptance of the diagnosis and prognosis. So if the patient and the family know less, it is more indicative that uh, MDT comes forward to discuss with the patient and family. And if the MDT feels that the patient is under high risk, for developing a hemorrhage, definitely, this is very important to be conducted as early as possible. And uh, the patients and families' desired level of participation in decisions about their care is at their disposal. And uh, patients and families' coping strategies can uh, also be um, seen by the team, okay? So uh, what happens when a hemorrhage occurs? So the general supportive measures is um, call for assistance, ensure a nurse stays with the patient, provide psychosocial support, apply pressure at the bleeding site if it is externally visible, and use dark towels. Why are we talking about dark towels? The impact of blood uh, is very much that, you know, it has a huge psychological impact on the patient and the family. So to uh, bring down the impact of blood is why we generally suggest for dark towels. Okay, so dark towels to camouflage the blood loss, use of suction if possible, and also sedatives. Sedatives can also be given because the patient is overwhelmed with this uh, huge gust of blood. He doesn't know what is going to happen. He probably thinks this is it. He is dying. He doesn't know how to react. So it becomes difficult to manage the patient as well. So this could be a time when you can think of sedating the patient. And general resuscitative measures. Um, when the patient is having a severe blood loss, you have to give priority for fluid replacement. So this can be uh, either, uh, this depends again on the patient's prognosis, his performance status. Yes, if the patient is gasping and is in the terminal event of his life, maybe uh, giving him blood transfusions is not going to make things any better. It is not going to add days into his life because the disease itself is uh, the cause for the mortality. So if, the patient is in the early trajectory of the disease. Yes, you go full on. You can transfuse the patient with colloids or uh, blood products to bring up the um, uh, to bring up the blood pressure. There's probably going to be a huge fall with all the bleeding. And again, specific interventions like ligation of the artery. Say, suppose a patient comes to you with severe hemorrhage, uh, uterine hemorrhage. Uh, as a part of his CA cervix, probably you can go for an intervention like ligating your uterine artery, right? Now, how do you manage? 
How do you manage? In case of mild bleeding, okay, you can give a radiotherapy. This can be given for superficial tumors or it can be given for carcinomas of the lung or GI tract, okay? You can give a superficial radiotherapy. And what do we often do? The most common thing that we all do is give a nice good pressure on the bleeding side. Yes, that is also very important. And then, as you can see here on the slide, ethamsilate and tranexamic acid. How can we give ethamsilate and tranexamic acid? I would like to have your thoughts on that. And please, can you write on the chat box? How will you want to give ethamsilate and tranexamic acid? Yes? Ethamsilate? or tranexamic acid? Yes, tablets, injections. Okay, Dr. Mohammed says tablets are injections. Dr. Kanika says intravenous. Yes. Any other routes? Transaminic acid, one gram IV in 100 ml NS. Yes, Dr. Vandana says. Dr. Sharon says, crush the tablets and apply them locally. Dr. Jinsi also agrees to that. Powder them and apply it locally. And Dr. Swati also agrees, you can be given IV or it can also be given topically for superficial bleeds. Yes, so that's basically what I wanted to bring out. Dr. Danvanti also talks of the fibrin glue that can be given locally. Wow, that's also right. So... Uh, we have all these options coming out here. It's really nice to see so many options and so much of sharing of information. So like I said earlier, you know, it's a, it's a, this is a mutual learning platform. So uh, ethan silate, as much as it is used orally, um, parenteral, again, it can be just even applied locally. So if you have tablets with you, you can just crush it down and put it on the ulcer bed and give a nice pressure on it. Or uh, you can also just break an ampule, put it on a surgical pad and press the uh, surgical pad down with pressure onto the ulcer bed. And again, topical adrenaline, sucral fate are also used in similar manner for local application. Sucral fate is also given orally for gastric bleeds. Now, how do you manage acute bleeding? First and foremost, calm the atmosphere because uh, bleeding is not something which is useful and it creates a lot of anxiety. So calm the atmosphere. Someone has to be with the patient. So advise your uh, staff nurse uh, to be there next to the patient. And if the patient is having a hemoptysis or hematemesis, make sure that the airway is patent. You can probably make the patient laterally positioned just so that you know the airway doesn't get blocked. Local control if possible. And maybe if you require sedation, it is a it's rather a bit of a terminal event. You require quite a bit of sedation there. You might also try giving a combination of midazolam and morphine at uh, the dose range that has been given over here. And like I said before, dark green colored blankets, clothes, towels, and one of the most important part here, support to the family. Because most often what happens is that when uh, there is a, cl a clinical deterioration, when there is an event of emergency, our focus is completely on the individual. Palliative care is not just about the individual, it's about the family as well. So we take equal care of both of them. So support the family during the event. So that uh, takes us to the end of Emirates. So like I said, emergency is uh, not just about these three things that we discussed in detail. So the rest of them, I just try to put it across as case scenarios. So we just very briefly just run through it. So it's just about a lot of you putting in your inputs on that chat box um, from what you read from here, okay?
So Marcella is a 46-year-old lady. She's on oral capacitabin, which is a oral chemotherapy agent. Uh, she is treated for carcinoma breast with skeletal metastasis. And now she is brought to you with confusion. She has also been eating less as she is having severe nausea and vomiting. What are you looking at here? Can I have answers on the chat box? What is Marjula having? She's on, uh, she's having breast, uh, CA breast with uh, bone meds and she's confused. She's having vomiting, she's eating less. Delirium, yes. What could have caused that delirium? Hyponatremia, okay, probably she is vomiting a lot and you know it has caused uh, hyponatremia. What more? Brain meds. Yes, uh, Dr. Danwanti was saying about brain meds. Okay, Dr. Mohamed says electrolyte imbalance, hypercalcemia. Dr. Kanmani says, okay, again, it could be brain meds. And Dr. Ayan says that it could be a raised intracranial pressure from the brain meds. Dr. Akila says, again, could it be hypercalcemia? The best part is that, you know, all of you are pretty right. It could be anything, isn't it? Unless and until you do the necessary investigations to confirm it. So as a differential diagnosis, you all have the list right there. And I put up this specially to discuss on hypercalcemia. Two things that is looking evident to me in this case history over here is that this patient is having skeletal metastasis. This patient was having confusion for a while. So both are features of skeletal uh, of hypercalcemia. And how do we manage hypercalcemia? What is the first thing we do for managing hypercalcemia? IV fluids, yes. Kanmani, Dr. Kanmani and Dr. Akilas agrees to that. Yes, IV fluids. Yes, Dr. Kanmani also says elastics because we are pushing in so much of fluid into that patient. It has to be, be balanced with some amount of diuretic there. Dr. Girija also says hydration. Dr. Akila says bisphosphonates. Dr. Revati says again diuretics. Dr. Naveen says calcium gluconate. Uh, calcium gluconate. Well, it is calcitonin. And that is usually given. Uh, Dr. Kanmani says calcitonin. Uh, Dr. Kanika says hydration, magnesium, Lasix. Yes, all this. So definitely it is IV fluids. First, you push the patient with IV fluids, say about three liters in the first day. And after that, you check the... Um, ionized calcium levels, okay? Why I say ionized calcium levels is because the, uh, the calcium, if you go for the serum calcium level, it might not actually, uh, it might not actually kind of, you know, reflect the correct uh, calcium level of the blood, okay? Because it is albumin dependent. So go for the ionized calcium levels if your lab has the facility for that, or you might just have to do up a bit of calculation after finding out what is the serum albumin level. Uh, Dr. Revati also says that Vasix inhibits calcium reabsorption. Thank you for that point, Dr. Revati. And again, after this, after the IV flu, what we do next is, as a next measure, we give bisphosphonate. A very commonly used bisphosphonate is zoledronic acid. We, of, we have others like uh, ibendronate and um, others are available. A more expensive versions are available. Least expensive among them is zoldronic acid. 4 mg in 100 mln is over half an hour. Sometimes you might just have to give an antipyretic before that or you know a shot of um, steroid like dexamethasone before that because sometimes some people can present with a uh, or, or with some uh, temperature after the infusion. Or some people can also have an event of hyperalgesia after the bisphosphonate uh, infusion. So these are just few things that you can keep in your mind.
And again, before administering uh, bisphosphonates, check the creatinine levels, right? Yeah. So again, calcitonin, can, once you give a bisphosphonate, you cannot repeat it until another three weeks. So if the levels are not coming down in still another three days, once you give a bisphosphonate, it's only in another 20, after about 48 hours that, you know, you can check it again, check the ionized calcium level again to see the corresponding effect. And if it is still not come down adequately, you can try giving calcitonin, which can be repeated multiple times, right? And yes, we have the next case. I shall try to hurry because we also have case presentation. Shanta is a 47-year-old lady with carcinoma ovary recurrence um, on single agent topotican, which is a chemotherapy agent. And she's been visiting you with complaints of pain, okay? She, and she's put on step three analgesics, okay? So one day later, uh, she is brought to you with irrelevant talk. And uh, she is being brought to you. And the daughter says, doctor, you prescribed my mother some heavy dose medications. Now she seems to have lost herself. What are we looking at? What are we looking at? CA ovary on chemo came with severe pain to your OP and you started that person on step three analgesics. Next day, she is brought to you with irrelevant talk. Yes, it is delirium. Dr. Haripriya, Dr. Vandana, everybody agrees to delirium. And what is the cause here for delirium? Dr. Haripriya says it could be hyponatremia. Yes, any other thoughts? We are looking at delirium, but what is the cause here? Hyponatremia, otherwise? The patient was started on step three analgesics, right? So probably the patient was started on opioids like morphine, strong opioids like morphine. Yeah, so it could be opioid related as well. So what do you do? Do you stop the opioid and let her be in pain? No. Yes, Dr. Haripraya says, no, you don't stop the opioid. What else can we do? Change the drug or the dose. Yeah. And what about the delirium? You can give antipsychotics like haloperidol hmm? and uh, manage the symptom. Yes, Dr. Vandana also agrees to haloperidol. So you can start the patient on haloperidol, say about 2.5 mg, or if it is very severe, to 5 mg. And um, uh, you can you know, bring down the symptom. And if uh, most often what happens is that in opioid-induced delirium, it is um, self-limiting. It's just that you know, over a period of two days, it, uh, uh, once the patient's adapted to it, uh, it, it gets rectified. So probably till then, you might just have to support the patient with some antipsychotics like haloperidol. So uh, else, definitely the next choice is to change the drug. Okay? Right. Pina on chemotherapy for carcinoma breast post her first cycle comes to you on the eighth day after the chemo with complaints of severe tiredness, fever, and rashes over the body. What is this? Chemo, eighth day, tiredness, fever, rashes. What are we looking at? Which emergency are we looking at? A-granulable cytosis, thrombocytopenia, Neutropenic sepsis, yes, that's what Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Vandana, and Dr. Akila. Yes, thank you for all those responses. We are looking at neutropenic sepsis, okay? So what? how do we manage? We take cultures, we take uh, cultures of the patient, and um, we do not wait for the report. We start the patient on empirical broad-spectrum uh, antibiotics, and... 
if the patient is improving, we continue the antibiotics. If the patient is not improving, once the cultural, provisional cultural reports are out, we change the drugs accordingly. Right? Right. With that, yes. Um, I have come to the end of the presentation and in just another five minutes, I will just talk to you about the non-medical emergency, yeah, that one of you had just uh, brought about. You know, there was this one lady uh, who came with her husband to my OPD many, many years back, um, almost about 10 years back. And uh, at that point of time, I did not have a home care facility in my clinic. And uh, this lady comes up to me and she tells me that, you know, um, she, uh, she wants me to prescribe something to, so that uh, basically that will kill her father. Why? Because it is out of love. Because she can't see her father suffering. Her father is suffering from carcinoma tongue and has been paralyzed for 14 years with a right side hemiplegia and the carcinoma tongue, which is now on disease progression, is a huge fungating ulcerated mass, which is uh, difficult to manage. And apparently even the children in the house are getting scared. There is so much of order that is filling the house because of that. And she can see her father in immense suffering. And she just asked me to prescribe her something that would kill her father. So I was in shock and I knew there has to be something to be done. And uh, what I could do is refer her to the nearest palliative center and not telling them that, uh, you know, there is something that they could do so that you don't think like this. I told them this, you will get all the help that you need from this place. So like that, I referred them to the highest center where they had a, a excellent palliative care clinic, which had a home care facility. And what happened was, as soon as the patient, uh, the uh, daughter reached there at the clinic, there was a home care team that went and visited her house to see her father. And to just see that the father was lying there on the bed uh, in a very pathetic state. And the mass, the fungating mass was horrible. They gave a bath to the father and, you know, they tried to dress the wound. They saw it was infested with maggots. They took about 217 maggots out from that. And they um, ended up counseling the family counseling the daughter. There was daily home care that was done for that patient. On the seventh day, he succumbed to his illness. So this is a non-medical emergency. The first thing that comes to my mind when someone tells me about a non-medical emergency, this is this. So this is an emergency where we were able to give that patient a dignity uh, at death. So having said that, let's move on to the case presentation. Yes. I am going to just uh, unshare my slide. Uh, Dr. Shul? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Shomya E, a radiation oncologist from Myanmar. And today I would like to present about a case of 58 years old male with a diagnosis of carcinoma lungs with superior vena cava obstruction. So uh, the patient was a 58 years old male with newly diagnosed carcinoma lung and his radiological uh, stages T3 and 2 M0 stage 3B. And so he was referred by a chest physician uh, with a chief complaint of severe breathlessness for one week and the swelling of iron face neck and upper M for two weeks. Next slide, please. 
So regarding birdlessness, uh, on arrival, it was very severe. Actually, it uh, started since three weeks ago, and at that time, uh, it was mild and on exhaustion only. Um, but the breathlessness became rapidly severe within one week, and uh, it is aggravated by moving and lying, and it is reduced by sitting up. So the patient cannot lie flat at all. Uh, he cannot sleep or eat well due to his breathlessness. So he stay at home with oxygen inhalation. And uh, at first, he refused to take any further treatment, uh, but uh, his breathlessness became se uh, very severe and he couldn't tolerate anymore. So he was transferred uh, to our radiotherapy OPD by his neighbors. And uh, during the, his, uh, he was transferred, he suffered from extreme breathlessness and so he felt that he would die. Uh, regarding swelling, it started in eyes and face two weeks ago, and then it later extended to the neck and upper M as well, and the swelling was more prominent in early morning. Another associated symptom has he has mild cough and sputum, he has loss of appetite and loss of weight, and occasional constipation. And uh, I miss that he also has some uh, mild right sided chest pain. And the patient also had a hemoptysis for a couple of days four weeks ago, and uh, it stopped after taking some medication prescribed by his chest physician. Next slide, please. So uh, the patient has got the diagnosis of carcinoma lens since one month ago after consulting with a chest physician. And at, uh, since that time, his chest physician uh, encouraged him, uh, suggest him to go to, uh, to, to consult with the oncologist. But at that time, uh, the symptoms of uh, SVCO did not appear significantly and the patient uh, only had mild symptoms like the mind breathlessness, mind chest pain and cough. So he was reluctant to take further treatment. So he uh, did not seek any other treatment and uh, he went back home and he stayed at home. Only at the time when he cannot tolerate his breathlessness, he came to our radiotherapy OPD. Uh, regarding past history, the patient has the history of carcinoma larynx. Uh, it was just stage one and it was uh, well treated 10 years ago and it caused a curative radiotherapy and another radiotherapy center. And after uh, after that, he took regular follow-up with the oncologist and ENT surgeon for his uh, carcinoma larynx for about five years. But after five years, he stopped the follow-up. And the patient has also had histories of retroviral infection, and it was diagnosed since 11 years ago, and he started taking antiretroviral therapy uh, since uh, two to three years ago. And his uh, up-to-date CD4 count is 97, so it's very low. And uh, regarding any other history, the patient has no, his, uh, no other proper medical history, no proper family history. The patient is a chronic smoker. It's for, it was about for about for, for 40 years, and even after surviving from the CL larynx, yeah, he is an occasional drinker as well. So on, uh, on examination and on arrival, the patient looks very dizzy, a respiratory distress present. He cannot speak well, uh, but he is well conscious. Uh, his temperature is slightly raised, 104 degree Fahrenheit, and his SPO2 is 88% without oxygen therapy, and but it raised to 96% with oxygen 6 liter per minute. His blood pressure 160, 90, pulse rate 110 times per minute, and edema uh, can be seen in his eyes, face, neck, and both arms. And there are congestion in his eyes and face, and there are dilated veins in his neck and upper chest, clubbing in his fingers and toes. And on heart auscultation, first and second sound can be heard and there is no other sound, no murmur. And on land auscultation, uh, bronchial breast sound reduced in the right upper zone and uh, wrong kind can be heard all zones of the uh, both sides of the lungs. So there are some investigation that the patient has taken and the chest x-ray show features of consolidations and right upper zone and features such as this of COPD. And CT chest results show bronchogenic malignancy and right upper low and language adjacent right upper low collapse and the features of SBC obstruction and bronchoscopic finding has tumor at right main bronchus and right intermediate bronchus. Uh, biopsy results show moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma right upper lobe. 
And his uh, blood picture has show uh, hemoglobin 9.5%, 9 9 WBC 18.1, platelet 421, CRP is 48. His urea, creatinine, electrolytes, and liver function tests are within the normal range. And his uh, later CD4 count is uh, about one week ago, and it's 97. So on arrival, the patient was very dizzy. So we first reassure the patient and we keep him in proper position and then we give oxygen inhalation according to his need. And uh, other immediate treatments are IV desimetazone 16 milligram stat and then 8 milligram BD, 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. IV pentobrazole 20 milligram 12 hourly and IV antibiotic cefriazole 1 gram plus abectin 500 milligram 12 hourly for seven days and IV fentanyl, then microgram start and continue IV infusion, then microgram per hour. After three days, hip dyspnea was well controlled with this dose without any side effects. So we changed to the transdermal patch to a 0.5 microgram per hour. So uh, in a similar case, previously uh, we used morphine uh, to control the dyspnea in similar cases, but uh, within this year, morphine availability in our country is not sustainable. So we have no choice and so we have to use fentanyl in this case. And nebulized ventolin 2.5 milligram start and eight hourly, nebulized saline 10 mil eight hourly, and then we arrange uh, for him to admit to hospital. So these are some oral medications. Uh, Power oral acetylcysteine, 200 milligram, 1 BD. Power oral derivalin, 1 BD. Power oral eprazolin, 0.5 milligram, 1 HS. Power oral lactulose, 10 to 15 cc HS and BRN. And we also encourage to continue his regular medications like ART. And uh, previously, the patient has already taken codeine, 1 TDS for his uh, mild chest pain and mild uh, breathlessness. So uh, we changed this coding to the transdermal fentanyl batch to a 0.5 microgram per hour every three days. And after that, uh, we discussed with chest physician, sergeant, medical oncologist, and primary physician, his primary physician for his um, management plan. Uh, for that patient, surgery and chemo are not feasible. So we decide to give palliative short-term radiotherapy for his SPC oscillation, uh, 20 gray and five fractions for a week. Uh, but uh, the patient denied any, any treatment. So uh, uh, we try to explain, we try to discuss with him. And after that, the patient accept only short-term radiotherapy and he still refused any, any other treatment. And he also also requested for discharge from hospital as soon as possible after the radiotherapy. Thanks, Libby. So, uh, so uh, he, uh, this is the psychosocial concerns of the patient. The patient was single and he has to live with his sibling family and I think uh, they are not very close to the patients and previously he had his own shop of selling fruit uh, but uh, now he has lost his job and so he, he don't have any regular income and uh, he become totally dependent on his sibling so uh, the patient has a concern about his financial problem uh, he has also some caregiver issues and so he is afraid of being uh, but as them for his sibling's family so he denied for any further treatment and, and then uh, patient is, came from the poor education background and had little awareness about health. And so he continued smoking even after surviving from carcinoma larynx. And so uh, he also had some misconception that he, he already had many life-threatening disease like retroviral infection, like carcinoma larynx and now CLS. So he think that it would be useless for him to receive any further treatment. And he so he refuses to seek for any and cancer treatment. And his main concern is the patient uh, has had some anxiety due to his severe breathlessness. And he even thought that he would die at, at that time. And now his breathlessness uh, reduced, but he still has some concerns and worries about the recurrent attack of severe breathlessness. So he said, I don't want to die with too much suffering. On other side, he has financial and caregiver issues, so he denied any treatment. And and his uh, also has some misconceptions. So it uh, I think, and uh, they make him feel of losing hope, rejecting any treatment, and being uh, depressed. 
So to summarize, uh, 58 years old male single, being chronic smoker with carcinoma, lung and superior vena cava obstruction and with underlying retroviral infection and with the previously treated carcinoma larynx uh, with the symptoms of severe dyspnea, edema of face, neck and arms and his physical symptoms have now been relieved after proper treatment. But I think his psychosocial concerns uh, need to be solved and his mother management plan should be discussed and his risky behavior like smoking should be counseled to be avoided. So here are the discussions wide and I would like to ask your opinions. Uh, Use of fentanyl and dyspnea uh, at the condition in which morphine is not available and use of palliative radiotherapy in this case. And uh, the patient also have anxiety and worries about recurrent tech of severe breathlessness, yet misconception about his illness and uh, his risky behavior. So uh, how can we overcome this issue? And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shun, for the detailed uh, presentation uh, of today's discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. I request the participants either to unmute yourself and give your comments on Dr. Shun's question or type it in the chat and then we can, so that we can discuss more about it. If you have any questions also to her, please uh, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Any responses, either unmuting or in the chat? Yeah, I think there are a few comments coming up. Dr. Jaya is asking whether oral steroids uh, help from these patients. Dr. Muhammad Saj is telling to continue steroids. So uh, I'd like to know what do you all think about uh, the role of oral steroids in this patients? Do you think it is going to help? Uh, as Dr. Jaya is asking. I think we have discussed uh, similar situations in the scenarios before uh, with the faculty presentation. So uh, do you think uh, steroids are going to help? Anyone would like to comment on the use of steroids in such patients and when they, especially when they do my hospital visits, can we start? Is there any benefit with steroids? Can we start and should we continue steroids? I think the group is maintaining absolute silence. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, we should continue, especially since the patient is refusing as a treatment. Uh, yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Dr. Sharon, please. Yes, so I, I assume uh, the patient is already on steroids. So I think what is normally practiced is uh, um, you know, slow tapering of the steroids, I think maybe over two to three weeks. And uh, I don't think it makes much sense to just continue continue uh, indefinitely. I think what we can advise the patient is to uh, taper, but if he has uh, worsening of breathlessness, probably go back to the previous higher, higher dose. I feel that would be uh, better. And then concurrently, maybe... Um, yeah, if IV morphine, but then maybe oral morphine, if he can access and, you know, if he de doesn't have that much pain, but definitely low dose uh, morphine will help with the breathlessness. So 
Uh, but I don't think long-term steroids will help. It's just uh, oh. when it aggravates, I suppose we should increase the dose of steroids or restart them. I don't know what uh, everybody else sees. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharon. Uh, Dr. Vinita, because the time yeah. is very less, I'm yeah. asking you today. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what I feel over here is that uh, the role of steroids in SVCO is basically to decrease the perihumeral edema. It is not actually going to, you know, halt the progress of the disease. So he has received RT, he has received high dose steroids. So maybe after tapering it down, like, you know, um, the discussion was on, um, only when the symptoms worsen, probably he should be given short course steroids. And one more reason why he probably should not be on continuous steroids is because he is um, having an immunodeficiency disorder, like HIV. So this could lead to, you know, uh, other opportunistic infections uh, like candidiasis, etc. So I think uh, we have to be, it's a double-edged sword that we're dealing with, uh, giving him a lot of steroids. So uh, use it wisely when needed. At the same time, I feel that uh, looking at uh, the way he's been denying treatment uh, and uh, he's been smoking continuously and some misconceptions I feel he's having a lot of spiritual pain here. I think it's not just the physical symptom, the psychological symptom. There is something like as if he's also trying to punish himself because, you know, he's probably done many things. We do not know how he has uh, got HIV. Maybe he was an IV drug abuse uh, or, you no, know, we don't know. So already he had one CA, CA larynx, a second malignancy that has come up and also the HIV status, which he's trying to fight against. So with all this, he's probably having some sort of, you know, the guilt and also trying to fight it uh, by punishing himself by, you know, there's no point in me taking treatment because this is what God has given me. You know, there is a usual thought that goes like that. So I think that has to be addressed in this patient. And probably after, you know, once that is addressed, getting him to come forward for treatment will be a little more easier. And uh, fentanyl uh, is an option for dyspnea. And uh, like you were saying, you know, he was on fentanyl IV. And then after that, after three days, he was continued to patch. But for a person who is uh, going to be started on patch immediately, one thing that you need to remember is that it is going to take a while for the morphine, um, I mean, for the fentanyl to uh, start acting takes almost about 12 hours. So probably the IV and the patch will have to overlap for about 12 hours. So that has to be kept in mind. Mm, yeah, I think that's what I have to add. Sure. Your patient sounds like he's very fatalistic. So few options and understanding the prognosis for him will cause more fear. So why is he so fearful? Does he not want to burden his sibling's family? And I would be surprised, uh, let if he lived more than three months. That is from uh, uh, Ian. Ian has joined us from UK. He's working there. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this situation is generally uh, patients will be scared, anxious, uh, especially any, I think any kind of breathlessness, they feel that they are actually facing death. Uh, mm -hmm. So the anxiety part is very uh, commonly seen, especially with this severe breathlessness. And people may not want to, uh, especially in India, they don't want to burden the family members. Uh, even the wife or the children or who are closest relatives possible, they may not want to burden the family with their symptoms. And I think, yes, the prognosis might be very, very, very short. So there is another question from Dr. Rishi. Please, in the short expected life, uh, short life expectancy, is it okay to not to push on smoking cessation? What do you think, Rishi, please? 
I'm sorry to ask you back, but just uh, would like to hear what do you think about it? Um, I think pushing on that might create add another stressor. I think it might be fine to just uh, uh, if it's uh, too much of a hassle, it's okay to just let it go at this stage is what I think. Yeah, I think uh, I also personally agree to Rishikesh. It's not about encouraging them to smoke, but there is very less time to push the patient to smoking cessation and other things. And there is a little time left and a little dignity left for most of them. So this is the only thing that they may have. Uh, they feel that they are still alive or something, some meaning. So uh, we don't say, okay, you continue smoking, but then we try to ignore even if they are smoking, <laughs> uh, especially when the prognosis is very, very. Uh, yeah, I also agree to that partially because one thing about one uh, thing that is apart uh, from all the other uh, addictions about smoking is that smoking can also affect the people around you. So, you know, you can always advise them to yeah. uh, stop. <laughs> we had a very uh, risky situation, a patient on very, I mean, end of, I mean, a few weeks left for him and he could not, he did not want to stop smoking. And to the next bed, there was a patient with peripheral vascular disease. So to whom is, who has stopped smoking and doctor told even passive smoking is very dangerous. So uh, we couldn't change the bed. So this person who was on, uh, was on, wanted to smoke. So we used to carry him on a wheelchair to the garden outside and make him sit there so that he can do whatever he wants so that the other patient is not getting. Because he was so adamant that I just don't want to stop. So anyway, I know that I'm going to die. So. But the other patients started like how with a lot of difficulties I stopped smoking because of my uh, illness and I'm in severe pain. I don't want to get that pain again. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Any other questions from the participants before we wind up today's session? Mm -hmm. If there are no more questions, uh, we can wind up today's session, thanking the faculty for a wonderful session as always, and taking us through various scenarios, because these are the things which stays in our minds rather than uh, hearing a lot of theory, because uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, most of us know the theory very well. But when it comes to patient care, the decision making is something that we have to learn, uh, especially in palliative care, each scenario is different from uh, one patient to another. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinita, for uh, your uh, presence and sharing your knowledge. And thank you so much, all the participants, for your interaction through the chat. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Pallian. And thank you to all the participants. The pleasure is absolutely mine because you all were really wonderful. And it was really nice interacting with you all. Thank you. Have thank a good Thank you, Dr. Vinita. Thank you so much. Because uh, it was me who troubled you at an old hour yesterday night for this session. No, thank you so much for totally accepting okay. the last moment. And uh, thank you for sparing your valuable time for our participants. And thank you, everyone, for making this session uh, very interactive. And um, with that positive note, this is Sri Priya, along with uh, Dr. Vinita Riju and Dr. Sri Devi Warrior signing off from the Tips Eco Hub. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone, stay safe, be happy, take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.